Amen. Hey, good morning. If you have your Bible, would you turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11? We're going to be there in just a moment. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. We're going to be there in just one moment. If you have a Bible in your home, you either bought it, a parent gave it to you, you went to a motel one time and you found it in the drawer and you took it even though it wasn't yours, bring it with you. The reason is the way that we preach and teach here is going through God's word and we want to make sure that we are sticking to God's word. I want you to go through it with us, amen? So we know what we're talking about. Hey, listen, before we go on, I need to, there is a serious, serious, I mean, pay attention to me. There is a serious, grievous sin that happened in the life of our church last Sunday and I need to bring you all in awareness to it. Last Sunday, when I was preaching and I looked at the video later, my hair was all jacked up and none of you guys said anything. <laughs> nothing. Not even like a, Psst, hey, pastor. Yes. Nothing. I'm, I'm not even the media team who has TVs over here who can talk to me, didn't say anything. Y'all just left your boy hang out here like alfalfa, hair all jacked up, <laughs> all over the interwebs. My mom is calling me, please call me head before you go into the stage. I mean, it was just bad, okay? So listen, if your boy doesn't look good, just let me know at some point. We got to get a signal, like just say Dorito or something, and I'll check out my frame and we'll figure it out, all right? Week two in our series, The Way of the Kingdom. Before we go on, I, I, those of you who don't know me, I love to read books. I probably read more books than I should, but I want to start recommending some books for you to read. So I have three books that I want to recommend for you to read. Call it, I don't know, Pastor's Book Corner if you want. And these are the three books I would recommend for you to read. So here they are on the screen. These are three books right here. Now they're going to go in order of what I would consider the easiest to read and then the most difficult to get through. So the first one is Living in Christ's Presence by Dallas Willard. It's a fantastic book. I would highly encourage you to read that book. It will open up your mind to the kingdom of God and to the reality of Jesus like never before. The second book is by a guy named Ken Costa, and he wrote a book called Strange Kingdom. I would highly recommend this book as well. It is Seven Devotional Thoughts on the cross. What is the reality of the cross and how as believers do we find ourselves at the cross and live from the resurrection and the cross? I would definitely encourage that book. And then the third book is in my top five all-time favorite books. It is called The Unshakable Kingdom and The Unchanging Person by the guy, his name is E. Stanley Jones. Now, before you buy this book, also you might want to buy a mind diaper because your brain will explode when you read this book. It is fantastic. It is deep. It is dense. It is profound. It is amazing. Amazing. So I would highly recommend those three books. We are in week two of our series, The Way of the Kingdom. What does it mean to live in the reality of God's kingdom? To live in the kingdom is to quite simply practice the way of Jesus. Listen to me. You and I will not grow in our faith, not in any way, shape, or form, if we do not practice the way of Jesus. We practice hospitality. We practice loving God. We practice loving our neighbor. We practice serving. We practice being in the word, fasting, praying. We practice the reality of what Jesus came to bring. And if we do not practice, you will not grow. It's that simple. I cannot practice for you. There's not enough church mechanisms or church programs or church ministries to make you a quote unquote better Christian. The only way for you to grow to be more like Jesus is for you to own the process of practicing the way of Jesus, to be an actual disciple of Jesus, not a disciple of the church, not a disciple of LifeGate, but to be a disciple of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus makes it quite clear that we are disciples of the kingdom. So what Jesus is saying is that if you are a disciple of him, you are equally and in the same way a disciple of the kingdom. The early church was not known as Christians. It's not till Acts chapter 11 we come to the book or the the church of Antioch where they're first known as Christians. Before then, the church were known as people of the way. They were the people that lived the way of Jesus. In fact, Paul, whose name, original name was Saul, got letters that he was going to go and persecute the people of the way. We see this in Acts chapter 9, verse 2. He was going to persecute people of the way. And what is the way of the kingdom? What is the way of the kingdom? In one word, if you could describe the way of the kingdom, it is the word salvation. 
The way of the kingdom is the way of salvation, the way to be saved. In the Christian faith, in the Orthodox faith, our doctrine says that God created all things. In the beginning, God created all things. He created the sun, moon, stars, the planets. He created the, the oceans, the forests, the land, everything. God created everything, and he created man, men and female, man and woman, in his own image, and he saw that all that he made was good. Everything God made was good. But then something happened shortly after that. The devil came, and he tempted Adam and Eve, and he tempted them to sin. And, he, and, and all of God's instruction was, the one thing you can't do in this garden, just so go back and read in Genesis, is you can enjoy the splendors of what I've created. The only thing I'm asking you not to do is do not approach or eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil tempts them and says, you should do this because God's holding out on you. Isn't it odd sometimes that that's the voice we hear in our minds? Hey, God's holding out on you. There's some good stuff going around just across the street, down the hall, on the other side of the city. God's holding out on you. And this is the voice of the devil tempting them, and they sin. And when they sin and they disobey God, what immediately happens is there's a fracture in the relationship between God and man. But there's also a fracture between man and man. When God approaches them and says, what have you done? What does Adam do? He blames his wife. There's an immediate conflict between humanity and God. And as the result, man has walked away from God. And ever since, we have been looking for the way to be saved. Listen, every way, every way, whether it's consumerism, whether it's self-autonomy, whether it's nationalism, whether it's totalitarianism, whatever it's capitalism, every single way, every single methodology is trying to save you. And without even you knowing it, we're trying to save ourselves by approaching and living our life in some way. And Jesus offers the way. He says, I have the way to be saved. And so the early church were known as people of the way. It was people that recognized that their salvation did not come from religious works, did not come from their own effort, did not come from earning, did not come from trying anything, but it came from surrendering to Jesus who died on the cross for their sins, conquered sin and death on their behalf, rose again three days later, put the Holy Spirit inside of them, and then sent them out to be ambassadors in the kingdom. They recognize that this is the only way to save myself is to live in the reality of what Jesus did, which was he died so that we could have life. That is the way of the kingdom. And Jesus invites you and I to live in the reality of the kingdom, to live and experience and to encounter the kingdom of God. This was the only gospel that Jesus ever preached. Jesus never preached prosperity gospel. He never preached a poverty gospel. He never preached a health and wealth gospel. He never preached a social justice gospel. The only gospel that Jesus ever preached was the kingdom gospel. It says in Matthew chapter four, from the time he began preaching, he began preaching of the kingdom. When Jesus rose from the dead, he stayed with his disciples for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says in the book of Acts, he stayed with them, teaching them about the kingdom. All Jesus ever did was to live and to teach the kingdom. That was his gospel. How to live under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ in your life. In every moment, in every way, do the kingdom thing. That's what he proposed. And as a person of the kingdom, to live in the kingdom is simply to live in the reality that you are a new creation. The Bible says in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, you are a new creation. Secondly, he says, you are a new citizen. I hate to break it to some of you, but being an American is not the same thing as being a Christian. I hate to, I know some of you are like really angry about that. I'm probably gonna get an email on Monday. It's fine, I just forward all those angry emails to someone else anyways. But I'm, <laughs> being a Christian is not the same thing as being an American. The American dream is the antithesis of the gospel. It is not the same thing. You are a new citizen. You are a citizen of a new, eternal, unshakable kingdom. The Bible says that we are ambassadors of Christ. 
So whatever nationality you are, whatever ethnicity you are, you should embrace it and love it because God chose for you to be born into that, but that is not who you are. That is where God has sent you to bring the kingdom of God to. You are a new creation. You are a new citizen. You are called to be part of a new community of people. It's called the church. Again, in Western culture, this is so difficult for us because we are raised to be individuals. This is not the reality in Eastern cultures. There's no such thing as when you're 18, you're kicked out. There's nothing like that. You are always part of a communal body. So the challenge in in the Western world is we read Bible verses and we assume that it's for me, the individual. For example, in Philippians, when it says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Now that's really cute if you think it's for yourself, but that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, he who began a good work in y'all will be faithful to complete it. We were called to be part of a community of people, and then you were called into a new commission, or rather a new mission, to know God and to make God known. That is what it means to live in the kingdom, and this is what Jesus invites you into. This is what he proposes to you. He doesn't propose a new set of religious ways, doesn't propose a new worldview. He proposes that you would live in the kingdom, in every way you would live in the kingdom. So go to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Jesus speaking to his disciples says this. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am lowly and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Dallas Willard says that you could summarize the ministry of Jesus in three areas. Firstly, the the ministry of Jesus was that he proclaimed the availability of the kingdom of God to everyone. No matter your race, no matter your background, no matter your past, no matter how far you've gone or how far you think you've gone, the kingdom of God is available to you. Secondly, Jesus taught what the kingdom of God was like. Look at Matthew chapter 13. The entire chapter is the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. And finally, Jesus manifested the presence of the kingdom of God. That is to say, every word he spoke, every single miracle, every person he touched was the power and the presence of the kingdom of God right here, right now. And this is what he offers to you. He offers to you to live in the kingdom, to be a disciple in the kingdom. So when Jesus says, come to me, follow me, what he's saying is, be my disciple, be my friend. Let's work together in this. And to be in the kingdom, to experience the kingdom, comes down to what I believe is three simple things. We're going to talk about the first one today. That is to be with Jesus. In every moment of every day, in every circumstance, you would be with Jesus. Next week, we'll talk about what it means to live a life where you worship in the Spirit. And it's not always about singing, but a life of worship in the Holy Spirit. And finally, on the last week, we'll talk about what it means to do the work of the Father. What does it mean to be with Jesus? See, the kingdom of God begins with this invitation. Come to me. Approach me. Come here. You are invited to do this life with me, Jesus said. And here's what I have come to believe. When you embrace being with Jesus, you become all that God has designed you to be. In other words, when you find the kingdom, you find yourself. And who here is not looking for themselves? Who here is not desperate to know who I am? In in, in the words of the immortal theologian Slim Shady, will the real Slim Shady please stand up? Now, I didn't say he was a good theologian, but he's sort of accurate on that one. Everyone is dying to know, who am I? What am I? And what I propose to you, in fact, what Jesus Christ proposes to you, is that the closer you get to the kingdom, the closer you become who God has called you to be, that you actually discover yourself and how he's designed you to be. And in every situation, Jesus says, come to me, 
be with me, and because I'm with you in every situation, we will apply what the kingdom says to apply. In every circumstance, in every moment, apply the kingdom. Apply the kingdom. Now, in my house growing up, there was this one little thing, and no matter what your ailment was, no matter what your problem was, my mom would bust this thing out, and it would cure everything, and it was called Tiger Bomb. And no matter what I had, I could come home like, Mom, I think I separated my shoulder. It is okay. I have Tiger Bomb. Put some on. I come home like, Mom, I think my lungs are collapsing. I have pneumonia. It is okay. I have Tiger Bomb. I mean, anything. Just anything. She would apply Tiger Bomb on it. It reminds me of those, those Snickers commercials. Having a bad day? Eat a Snickers. It's sort of like, hey, marriage in a difficult season? Apply the kingdom. Kids driving you nuts? Apply the kingdom. Struggle in dating? Apply the kingdom. In every single thing, you apply the kingdom. And the kingdom is always relevant. In every situation, in every moment, in every conversation, the kingdom decision is always the right and best decision. And you can only get to that place is if in every moment you are living with Jesus. You are being with Jesus. And this is a grand invitation that he brings you into because you and I were designed for this kingdom. You and I were designed to live in this kingdom and any kingdom outside of this kingdom will crush your soul. It will bruise your spirit. So Jesus begins this invitation with come to me, come to me. I think the four greatest words, the most prolific, the most profound the most beautiful, the most radical words in all of scripture are these four words. The word became flesh. The word became flesh. That is saying that God looked down on humanity and did not leave you and I to our own devices, did not leave you and I to the brutal pain and fight against temptation. He did not leave you and I to struggle in the sorrow alone. No, he entered into, through his son, Jesus Christ, the word of God became flesh. He entered into the human story. And when he did that, he entered into your story. So whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, Jesus Christ has entered into that place with you. See, every other faith says, you've got to come to me. You've got to make some choices and change some things, and you've got to get to me. It is only in the Christian faith where God says, I will come to you. And you cannot come to me unless I come to you first. The word became flesh. The kingdom became flesh. When Jesus Christ took a step, when he took his first breath, he inaugurated the kingdom into this earth. He brought it into fruition. He delivered it here on this earth. The kingdom is here. So when you looked at the face of Jesus, you were looking at the kingdom. You were looking that all that God has to offer, all of his character, all of his attributes, all of his nature was found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, he is the radiance of the image of God. He is the exact imprint of the nature of God. He came here and brought his kingdom here. And when he did, when he came here, he brought what humanity had never known before. It was one simple thing that you and I desperately need. When Jesus took his first breath and he uttered his first word, what God delivered on this earth was something called grace. The unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of God. So to be with Jesus is to be in grace. It's to be in the favor of God, the unmerited, beautiful favor of God. And I want to show you three things from this text that have to do with grace. See, the first thing that Jesus does is he surprises you with grace. You and I are surprised by grace. The disciples were surprised by grace. See, when Jesus says, come to me, that is an invitation that no one had ever heard before. 
See, every other invitation was go clean yourself up, get yourself right, get the right parents, get the right pedigree, and when you've done this and a series of other things, then you can approach me. Then you can come to the temple. Then you can come be one of us. Go get your act together first. But isn't it marvelous that Jesus says, come to me. Anyone can approach me. Doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your tax bracket, doesn't matter what your, what your criminal record is, doesn't matter what your past record is, it doesn't matter. He says, anyone can come to me. Think about that for a moment. The God of the universe who spoke everything into motion is here and he is present and he is saying to you, come to me. And like wandering children, we begin to run away from the Father. And all the while the Father does not move, he says, I'm staying right here. Come back to me. Come to me. Come to me. This is a radical invitation. And those words, come to me, simply mean, trust me. Trust me. Once a day, I have this conversation with my kids. Don't you trust me? Don't you, son, don't you trust me? And I can see what his mind is thinking, like he knows he's supposed to say yes, but he's in a battle in his mind right now between good and evil. And he knows, like, I think I'm supposed to trust you. I've always been fed. You always put me to bed. There's always been a roof over my house. You always take care of me. You've always given me everything that I need, but I don't know if I could trust you right now, dad. I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure you can do what it is that I need. Listen, I can change the batteries in a robot. Trust me, I can do that, Okay. And the invitation of Jesus is, trust me with everything, everything, not just your salvation of what happens to you when you die. No, trust me with everything. Trust me with your marriage. Trust me with your children. Trust me with your finances. Trust me with your relationships. Trust me with your work. Trust me with your ambitions. Trust me with your desires. I love the way Dallas Willard puts this. He says it this way. The gospel can be understood with two words, trust Jesus. Trust him with everything, not just what happens when you die. Trusting Jesus and becoming his disciple is the same thing. So Jesus says, surprise, surprise. I've given you someone you can trust who will never let you down, who will never leave you nor forsake you. Trust me. And who should trust Jesus? Who is invited to trust Jesus? Well, apparently it's all those who labor and are heavy laden. It's all of those who labor and are heavy laden. Now, in context, with the people that Jesus was speaking to at the time, the explicit meaning are those who were held under the weight and the burden of religion, specifically the law. Not political law, not Roman law, but Jewish religious law. Now, the law was not instituted by man. In fact, God instituted the law. He said, if you are going to be my people, I want you to live within these laws. But the law was a burden. And then what happens is man got involved. And anytime man gets involved, boy, those burdens get a lot heavier, don't they? Anytime man is involved with his imperfection, with his selfishness, with his ideas, with his faults, with his brokenness, things get a little bit heavier, which is why I always say, if you find a perfect church, stop going. You're going to ruin it. (laughs) And the weight of the law became heavy for people. See, man started adding stuff. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day started adding stuff that God never said. How you have to look, how you have to walk, what side of the road you can walk on, how you have to shave your head, how you have to comb your hair, how you have to wear jewelry, I mean, how you have to wash your hands. I mean, everything was just this burdensome law and they were living under the weight of this law of never being good enough. I don't think anyone here knows what that feeling is like of never measuring up, of never being good enough. This is what the law did. Now, the law that God designed wasn't bad. See, the law was simply an x-ray. If I went to the doctor and and I'm like, hey, man, something's going on in in my chest. And he's like, let's do an x-ray. We take an x-ray and he's like, oh, man, it looks like you have a clogged artery, which with my body is hard to under... I mean, I know that's difficult to even even fathom. But let's say it just happened, okay? Let's say the Laffy Taffies I kept eating just finally just worked their way up and just clogged clogged me up. And and he said, oh, man, you have a clogged clogged artery. I'm like, great, what should should we do? Let's take another x-ray. Like, the x-ray is not going to make me better. 
The x-ray is not going to heal me. The x-ray is not going to transform me. In the same way, the law was simply meant to reveal to you the nature of your sin, but it was never designed to redeem you from the grips of sin. The law was meant to inform you about who you are. It was never designed to transform you into who God wanted you to be. Only Christ could do that. But the law became a burden for these people. It told them that they never measured up. That was explicitly. Now, implicitly, who Jesus is speaking to is anyone who feels the weight of never measuring up, anyone who feels the weight of living in the constant rat race, of trying to keep up with the Joneses. I don't even know if the Joneses are around anymore, but that's who they were trying to keep up with. Anyone who lives in the constant pressure of having to perform or do some religious activity or anything that was just burdening you, like that's who he's speaking to. Any decision that you are making in life that is causing you labor and pain and sorrow and the weight of what you are carrying, this is who Jesus is speaking to. Now, what we call culture, Jesus called the world. The culture of the world, the culture that we live in, is paralyzing and it is soul crushing. It is soul crushing to live in the culture that we live in. And Jesus says, this is who I'm inviting. You are whom I'm inviting. Because the ultimate, listen to me, the ultimate pursuit of self is exhausting. Self-autonomy, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, self-anything. Eventually, it is exhausting. And it will crush your soul. It will damage your spirit. So Jesus says, surprise. Here is a much better invitation. I have a much better invitation for you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What he's saying is, I will give you grace. Receive grace. Receive the grace that is the forgiveness of your sins. Receive the grace that will set you free from the burden of trying to be something you're not. Release from the freedom of constantly trying and trying and trying and trying your way, whatever way that is. I'm going to give you grace in the midst of this. That is where being with Christ begins, receiving his grace. God, I receive your grace because I know I can't do this. Give me your grace. Now, being surprised by grace, receiving grace is where it begins. But the only way to live a life in the kingdom is not simply to receive grace once, but to be sustained by grace. You have to be sustained by grace. See, many people believe in grace or they receive grace for their salvation only to go about life in their own strength. Yeah, I'll receive the grace to save me, but then everything else I'll do on my own. Like everything else I'll take care of. I don't need God for that. And that is exhausting. And that is crushing. My dad had these sayings he would always say around the house. He began to memorize them because he would say them so often. And one of them was this. He would say, the spirit of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot sustain you. God will never take you somewhere. God will never begin shaping you to be someone by his grace and not have his grace to sustain you in the journey. Listen to me. Without grace, life in the kingdom is impossible. It is impossible. Without grace, it is impossible. Possible. What will happen is that you will become a person who lives based on fear and not based on the kingdom. You will live in the fear of failure. You will live in the fear of, of things that could be taken from you. You will live in the fear of something happening to you or the people around you. You'll constantly live in, you'll live in the fear of being caught. You'll constantly live in fear. So what you'll start doing in public and or in private is you'll begin performing for God. You begin doing all the right things that you think God is looking for, and you begin to perform for him. You begin to start earning grace. So if you've ever had this moment in your life, and I'm right there, I say it almost every day because I need God's grace. God, how come you won't because I've fill in the blank? God, I've been doing this, and I've been doing that, and I've been doing this. How come you won't do this? How come you won't come through? How come you won't answer me? What I'm saying is, God, I've earned from you. You owe me. 
And that is a heavy weight to carry. You'll eventually get caught in a life of activity, whether secular activity or religious activity. Either way, it'll be some activity which will eventually, all the fear will eventually lead you into a life of guilt and shame, a constant life of guilt and shame. And there's so many of you, listen to me, there's so many of you older, older parents who've raised kids. And I just want to set you free this morning. It is time to stop parenting out of guilt and shame. Listen to me, you did the best you could with what you had. God forbid you were human beings. God forbid you made mistakes. There is grace in the journey. At some point, you've got to let it go. You've got to let your kids stop manipulating you. You've got to let your kids stop guilting you and shaming you. You did the best you could with what you had. Do not let the voice of the enemy trick you and tell you that you have to live in this guilt and this shame anymore. You do not. There's so many of you who've been abused and and mistreated by the people who are supposed to love you. And let me say that that is not God's design. That was not God's desire for you. And the enemy wants to keep you in fear and he wants to keep you in guilt and he wants to keep you in shame. And that is not the grace of God. God wants to release you from that today. God wants to set you free from that today. He wants to set you free from the guilt of your past, set you free from the shame of your past. He wants to set you free into a new trajectory, a new life of grace into the kingdom. You must be sustained by grace, which is why Jesus says these words next. He says, take my yoke, take my yoke my yoke. See, in the day, a yoke was a piece of wood that was heavy, and it was put onto two animals so that two animals could do the work together. Now, what Jesus is saying is the yoke is actually you are yoked to the law, and the law not being good enough, not not measuring up enough. All the guilt, all the shame is pressing down on you. So take that yoke off, and then he says, put on my yoke. Now, you have to picture this in your mind. He's not saying, you stand over there and let me put this yoke on you. No, he's saying, it's already on me. Join me. I'm holding the yoke, so join me. And who's carrying the weight? He is. He's carrying the weight. My kids love to help me out move stuff around the house. Like, Dad, can I help you? Dad, can I help you? So they pick up something. Who's carrying 90, 99.9% of that weight? I am. I mean, my kid just has, and, I, and my four-year-old's like, oh, Oh, it's, uh, and if he let go, he would just be like, oh, oh, he's not holding anything anymore. <laughs> like I've taken the box off of him and he's still just, oh, it's so heavy. Oh, oh dad, it's so heavy. He puts his hands back up. <laughs> like who's carrying the weight? He is. He is carrying the weight. And listen, some of you have lived under the pressure of failure and guilt for so long. And you're carrying this weight for so long. My, my son is in, in the, the, the GT program, the gifted and talented program at school. And his teacher said, hey, lately your son just doesn't like taking tests. He just doesn't want to take tests. So I talked to him, I'm like, hey, buddy, you got to understand, listen, good grades in an Asian home, that is a big deal, okay? <laughs> like, that is a big deal growing up, okay? And, I, and I'm way, way different with my kids than my parents were. I, I would come home with like, a, I'd be on the school bus with, with a 98, like got a 98 on my test. And <laughs> My friend's like, what's wrong, man? <laughs> I got a 98. I can't go home. That's a, you got a 98? That's amazing. Are you serious? My parents won't feed me for a month. <laughs> Terrified. I can't go home. I got a 98. Like, that is a lot of pressure in, a, in an Asian house. Like, education means everything. So with my kids, I'm trying to be a little bit different. Like, hey, son, what's going on that you don't like taking tests? And we get through a conversation, a conversation, a conversation, and he goes, I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. I keep telling him, listen. It's not about the grade that you make. I just want you to try your hardest. If you get an A, we'll go get pizza. If you get a D, we'll go get pizza. What I care about is that you try your very best. Try your very, whatever your best is, put forth your best effort. That's what I'm asking of you. Nothing else. Be the hardest working person in the room. You don't have to be the smartest. You have to be the best looking. Be the fastest. Just give your best effort. And so many of you are so used to waiting for God to just zap you. Just bam, zap you. Just the wrath of God coming on you when you don't measure up. And if you live that life, you are rejecting grace. You are denying the grace of God because it's his weight to carry. Listen to me. He says, take my yoke. Whose yoke is it? His yoke. Take my yoke upon you. Take 
my, it's mine to carry. I'm inviting you to go with me. Now he doesn't say my yoke is absent and my burden is nothing. He says my yoke is easy and my burden is light, which means we still have to join him in being with him. It's not just, well, I see Jesus walking there and I'm just gonna hang out over here and Jesus, you go take care of everything and let me know when it's clear to come in. He says, no, we're gonna walk together. We're gonna do this together. We're gonna go together. It reminds me of this old song my dad used to sing in the house. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Like we're we're gonna go on this thing together. And in a culture of rugged individualism, this is difficult for us to take hold of. We still believe that God says this, take my yoke and now go. He says, no, 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 take my yoke and together, let's be together, let's go together. Because listen to me, church, you and I were not designed. We are not designed to carry the weight of marriage. We were not designed for it. We were not designed to carry the weight of dying to yourself. You were not designed for it. You are not designed for the weight of parenting. You are not designed for the weight of being single and dating. You are not designed to carry pain and sorrow and tragedy and suffering. You are not designed to carry it alone. So Jesus invites you to be with him. Be sustained in the grace of God. I know so many people who receive grace for salvation just to reject it for living. Receive this grace, walk with me in this grace. That is the gift of God. The gift of grace is that God invites you to walk with him. Be with him. So to be with Jesus is to be surprised by grace, receive it. To be sustained in grace. But eventually, God will not force you. Eventually, you have to surrender to grace. You have to surrender it to it every single day. So Jesus says this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. You know what I love about Jesus? Jesus didn't try to force anything. You read the gospels. He never tried to force anything. He never tried to manipulate anything. He never tried to go behind the scenes and, and, and you know, make, make some arrangements here and then bring that out. He never tried to do alignments with people. He never forced his way anywhere. His was an unforced life. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it. Learn to live in the unforced rhythms of grace. Eugene Peterson, who writes some phenomenal books, the way that he describes this passage puts it this way. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Aren't you tired of forcing things to happen? Aren't you tired of trying to manipulate conversations? Tired of trying to do things behind the scenes instead of just giving it to the Lord? Like, Lord, I'm just gonna give it to you. I'm gonna trust you with this. I'm just gonna give it to you and we're gonna walk together on this and stop trying to force your way into anything. I wanna show you what this looks like with a little little activity to get our blood going. I'm gonna wrap up here in just a second. But I want you just, everyone, I want you to clap at... Uh, Jason, come up here. Just help me out for this for a second. I want you to clap at 79. Um, Jason, like, I want you in your mind to assume what 79 BPM is, and I want you to clap on the downbeat of four. Ready? So that's one, two, three, four. But I want you to assume what 79 BPM is. Can you get 79 BPM in your ear? Well, don't let them hear it. I only want you to hear it. All right? So uh, ready? Clap. So everyone, on the count of three, start clapping in four on 79 BPM, 79 BPM on the downbeat. Ready? Set. One, two, three, go. All right, stop. First of all, that was really good clapping. I expect much more during worship from now on. (laughs) But if you listen to what happens, this is just the way the humans work. We begin to go with whatever the dominant sound is. Whatever the dominant beat, all right, follow me, right? Just clap with my clap. You will, you will, you will just do whatever, whatever the majority sound is. And if you don't hear something, what you'll do is for it. Now, none of us, none of us were at 79 BPM. None of us were counting, because what? Because why? Because we can't hear the rhythm. We can't hear it. But if we have a leader 
who knows what the rhythm is, who knows what the beat is. We don't have to try to force ourselves to find it, force ourselves to discover it, or be manipulated by what everyone else is doing. What we have to do is to keep our eye on the leader. So if Jason knows what it is, so Jason, give us like on four. Now, what we're doing, what we're doing is we're following an unforced rhythm. So Jesus says, stop trying so hard. Stop trying to do it your way. Stop trying whatever way you have. That's fine. If you keep your eye on the one who knows the rhythm, you can follow in a way that's unforced. Jesus knows the rhythm. He knows the rhythm of grace. He knows that it's unforced. The problem is you and I have been trying to find the beat on our own. We've been trying to find the rhythm on our own. So we've explored different ways. We've explored all different kinds of ways, whatever way that is. And so we try and we try and we keep trying and we keep trying. We keep forcing ourselves to find where God is. And he's not there because he's not in that rhythm. You have to find where Jesus is setting the rhythm for your life. What is the pace? I love the way one pastor puts it. He says, you've got to find the pace of grace. What is the pace that God is setting, the rhythm that God is setting? And when you do, it is unforced. You have to surrender to the unforced ways of Jesus. He will not force his way on you. He will not push you to do it his way. He will invite you to do it his way. And it's up to you. You could keep trying your way, keep going at it your way, or you could first and foremost receive the grace of God for the salvation of your life. Because grace is where it begins. Ephesians chapter two, verse four. It says, but God being rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved through faith. And if you are here today and you've never received the grace of God for the salvation of your life, you've never believed that Jesus went on the cross for your, ha- your behalf and my behalf. He died on the cross taking all of your sin and in exchange gave you all of his righteousness. He took all of your attempting and gave you all of his grace. Then I implore you to do that today. But then some of you need to receive the sustaining power of grace in your life that in every moment of every day, you would do the kingdom thing. And the kingdom thing is to live with Jesus, to be with Jesus, to be in the grace of Jesus. And it is a way that will never let you down. It will never leave you. It will never forsake you. If you would just surrender to grace today. And I wanna end in a moment. I know I haven't really preached today, but I'm getting there in just 30 seconds. Give me 30 seconds. I'm going to preach to end out. What is this grace that you and I so desperately need? What is this grace that God is giving you and saying, you need this grace because the weight of what you are trying to do is going to crush you. It is going to crush you and devastate your soul. You need my grace because God's grace is inexhaustible. You can't outrun it and you cannot live without it. It will sustain you in the valley of the shadow. That is why even after thousands of years, we are still saying the words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. His grace will feed your soul. It will comfort you in suffering. It is beyond your ability to fully understand, but within your grasp to fully experience. It is God's gift, his free gift, his undeniable gift. It comes without measure. It is your sufficiency in weakness and your strength in sorrow. It will lift you up in failure and it will humble you in success. It will forge your character. It will fight your temptation. In every season, his grace is a guarantee. It is the assurance of your faith. It is the song and the melody of your heart and in every season. It is the seed of your salvation and the glory of Christ within you. It is the love of God expressed and the glory of God experienced. And no matter who you are or where you've gone and what you've done, the grace of God will always lead you home. You can be assured of that. So would you receive his grace today? Would you take his grace today? Would you open your hand and stop trying? Stop 
trying. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. God, we give you this moment.